introduction in this house. Uh, he's our pastor's pastor. Uh, when pastor told me that he'd be coming doing the service, there, it only made sense. I mean, you bring such a wisdom, you bring such a presence of calmness and peace about you. Uh, and, and to walk the church through that today, I think there's no better man. So y'all please give it up for our pastor's pastor, Pastor Mike Van Britson. Uh, May his grace and mercy be multiplied to us this morning. It's my pleasure and honor to be here. So glad to have been invited by your pastor to be a part of this difficult time in his life. We don't always know what to say, do we? So being there matters tremendously. As far as I'm concerned in life, no matter how many prizes or promotions or awards or times of temporary pleasure we have, the two most important activities in life that we can ever be involved in is to love someone and to be loved. Everything else is background music. What a great church. What a great atmosphere here this morning. And of all the blessings that I have this morning, having my firstborn charity with me today is a pleasure. Would you just stand for a moment and would you make my daughter welcome? Did you ever hear that statement? They are the blood of my heart. There she is. In the Gospel of Mark chapter 14, there is a message here, so many applications in this wonderful text. May I remind you that Jesus said, if you've seen me, you have seen my Father. So in this text, we're going to see a a perspective, many perspectives, of what our Father is like. One and only one is a burden on my heart this morning to share with you, and I could entitle it, She Has Done a Good Thing. So in Mark chapter 14, verse 3, the Amplified Version, And while he was in Bethany, a guest. You know why Jesus didn't have a home to live in when he was here? Because he wanted to live in our home. And I don't know if he uh, asked Simon Peter if he could stay in his home at Capernaum or if Simon Peter asked him. But Jesus, our Lord and Master, took up residence in a home at Capernaum Man, he turned that house into a haven of peace and pardon and healing. And the entire neighborhood came to the door of that house. And then the surrounding villages. Listen, we are blessed and we're given an opportunity to invite Jesus Christ to live and abide within us. Hallelujah. So he was a guest in the house of Simon the leper as he was reclining at table. A woman came with an alabaster jar of ointment, perfume of pure nard. She's about to change the atmosphere of that room. I I believe the worship ministry changed the atmosphere here this morning. And I believe the choir out in front of me changed the atmosphere. I heard a lot of singing going on behind me, a lot of whistling and a lot of shouting. And uh, uh, some people were off key, but I didn't care. (laughs) I'm just glad you're here. But she's about to change the atmosphere, and all she's going to do is the best she can do. And that's all it takes. It was very costly, and it was precious. And she broke the jar and poured the perfume over his head because it was for him. But they were, there were some who were moved with indignation and said to themselves, to what purpose was the ointment, the perfume, wasted. For it was possible to have sold this perfume for more than 300 denarii, a laboring man's wages for a year, and to have given the money to the poor, and they censured and reproved her. Ah, but Jesus, listen, no matter what you're going through in life, Jesus has got your back. If you put him first in your life, you'll, you'll be reassured at all the ages and stages and seasons of life, he'll always be there with you. 
When others are talking ill about you or you can't figure out what to do, listen, he'll be there. Listen real closely with your heart. He'll be talking to you. And Jesus said, let her alone. Why are you troubling her? And here's my text. She today has done. She didn't just think about it. She did it. It's one thing to have a good aim in life, but then you got to finally pull the trigger. You have to do something. And she came to that place where she decided, I've listened to his teaching. I know what he's done for me inside of me. I know what it feels like now to have a dwelling where the peace of God runs like a deep ocean. He had done so much for her, and she had listened so closely to his teaching. His words had become life to her. His words were, she memorized them, she meditated on them, and she came to a conclusion, if I'm going to pour this oil on his head from what I've been listening to him, I better do it now because he's not going to be with us much longer. So she paid attention, and listen, that's the first step to all of us receiving from God of the great things that he wants us to have. He said, if we diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord our God, he'll put none of these diseases upon us. Diligently hearken says, I listen to it so closely, and I write it down to understand it. I even work at turning it into a song. I'm not a songwriter myself, but I have taken scriptures that Jesus has given to me that fed my soul, and I put a little melody or a tune to it, whatever it is, in my own times of private worship, either at the house or in a, a car or my truck. I sing these songs that he has given to me because he said diligently hearken make what I tell you so important to you that you not only know it very well but you you know it so well you could teach somebody else now that's what we're talking about if you want to have faith that overcomes the world and he said if you do put me first then the kingdom of heaven and all of its resources are yours she's done a good thing she's done a beautiful thing to me a praiseworthy and noble thing. Oh, he's taking them to school. He said, get on the bus. I'm taking you to school. I want you to see what your father is like. I want you to see what a heartsick father, from Genesis to Revelation, we who read the scriptures realize that we have a heartsick father who is looking for us. And yesterday at the service for your dear Lori, you know, the thought came to me is, um, what did pastor say? Um, he was her Wyatt, and she was, okay. Well, higher than that, love, Lori was the pearl of great price to our Lord. He gave up everything to redeem her. There was nothing that he had, brother, that was worth keeping. He gave up his crown, he gave up his glory, and he wrapped himself in humanity and came to the earth and he found Lori in a lost condition and picked her up out of her lostness, put him on his royal strong shoulders and gripped her with grace and mercy and said, I'm taking you all the way home. And it wasn't too many days ago that he fulfilled that promise when he said, Lori, I'm taking you home. And when I get you there, I'm going to tell everybody, worship and celebrate with me that which was lost is found and I've brought her home he loves us and this woman knew you know when someone loves you and she knew that Jesus loved her and she had listened closely to what he was saying and so she had thought this is the best I can do I'm taking the most expensive thing that I have and I'm going to break it wide open and pour it totally on him and it moved our Lord it moved the master and when he heard them uh, censoring her, um, he stopped everything. For you always have the poor with you, and whenever you wish you can, do good to them. But you will not always have me. She has done what she could. She came beforehand to anoint my body for the burial. Listen, the two greatest commandments in the Scripture, the Bible is wrapped up in two commandments. Thou shalt love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, and all of your strength. You fall so deeply in love with him that you can trust him through any storm. You can walk into any battle of life. 
You can enter into any season because you love him and you know that he loves you. Faith to me is more a thing called trust, that we trust him. We have tried him. How many would say you've tried him and you found out that he's, he can be trusted? Anybody here gone through some times where you thought, I don't know if I can make it through this, but you found out you can make it through it by his grace. Me too. I was in a storm years ago in my life, and I didn't think I could survive it. But you know what? I didn't only survive it, but I have learned to thrive through him through it. The things that I thought were tearing me apart were making me stronger. But what were they doing? They were driving me closer to embrace my heartsick father who can't wait to spend time with me and get me home to have me forever and ever and ever. I am loved, I'm telling you. And I am the apple of his eye. I'm the treasure hid in the field. I'm everything to him. And I like what John said. John said in his writing about himself, it was John, the one Jesus loved. It's very important for us to say, I'm the one he loves. If you're ever going to use these two words, I am, then be careful what follows, I am. Because the power of life and death is in the tongue. So after you say, I am, make sure you stop and say, who am I in Christ? Who am I in him? What has he done for me? Because you don't want to go around being a victim. You want to go around being a victor. Don't let any of your situations tell you you can't make it. That makes you a victim. Don't say because of the color of your skin or your education or lack of it, your height or your weight or whatever. Listen, my friend, you're never a victim. You're always a conqueror. You're a child of the living God. He's, he's covered you with his best robe, given you his ring. Put feet on, uh, sandals on your feet so you can walk, so you can move, so you can journey through life. You know what? I love what the uh, father said to the eldest son in that great story. We call it the prodigal. His elder son was defiant and angry that the younger son was forgiven. The charges were dropped against him so readily and so easily. But could you say hallelujah that our sins are dropped when we turn to Jesus readily, quickly? And the father went out. In, in love because he's a heartsick father. He wants fellowship with his children. He went out and he literally begged the elder son to come in. And then he told his elder son this, and I have memorized it. I have meditated on it. I feast on it. He told the elder son, you're my son. You don't have to earn anything. Because the elder son said, I work hard for you. I'm always faithful. And his father said, you're bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. You're my son. You're always with me. And everything I have is yours. Woo! I meditate on that. When I'm getting a little doubtful, I, I can be uh, melancholy, sometimes struggle with a little bit of uh, depression, and I will remind myself that I'm his that he is always with me and I am always with him and that everything he has is mine. How can you be melancholy or fretful or anxious when he's always with you and everything he has is yours? Well, this and more in the thinking of this woman caused her to say, I'm going to the meeting house where they're meeting and I am going to pour out my praise and my thanks and my gratitude. He's going to know that I trust him and that I love him. She has done in verse 8 what she could. She came beforehand to anoint my body for the burial. And surely I tell you, surely I tell you, wherever the good news, the gospel, is proclaimed in the entire world, what she has done, what she has done, will be told in memory of her. I could almost hear Jesus say that. And then when he says that, I realize that's what our Father is like, that this is so important. So I ask myself, what's so important here? There's so many applications here in this wonderful text, but I'm looking only at she has done 
a good thing. She has done what she could. And I thank, thank God because I can do what I can do, but I can't do what you can do, but I could do what I can do. And that tells me that I can do something right in this lifetime that causes God to stop everything and to say, look at what Mike's doing. And what is he doing? He's doing something good. The writer who wrote about Jesus said he went about doing good. How profound is that? How spiritual is that? I want to be the best member of the church. I want to be all, all out for you. Well, then find somebody to do something good for and do it. Because in this text, Jesus is stopping everyone, silencing you and I today in this meeting and saying, listen, children, if you want to do something to honor God, do something good. Do it out of your heart. Something that you've been convinced of that God wants you to do. Because in this text, we also recognize that Mary was a woman of communication with God. Or we could call it prayer. Prayer. Prayer is the place where God can speak to us. But let me hang on to this. Go to John chapter 21, verse 24 and verse 25. This is the same disciple who is testifying to these things and has recorded them. And we know without any doubt that his testimony is true. And there are also many other things which Jesus did, which if they were recorded one by one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. But what this woman did is recorded. So what she did is very important for us to consider this morning and for the rest of our lives. Jesus said, I want it recorded what this woman did. And yet all the things that he did if they were recorded, there wouldn't be enough books in the world to contain them. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. For we are, Brother Joseph, and who's this good-looking youth? It's Josh. We are his workmanship, aren't we? His own masterwork, a work of art. We are created in Christ Jesus. We're reborn from above spiritually, and we're transformed. We're renewed, and we're ready to be used. For what purpose? For good works, which God prepared. What? Which God prepared for us beforehand? You mean good works that God, my Father, wants me to do? He's planned out, and I need to find out what he wants me to do because that's the excitement and the adventure of life because I could do something for you that no one else can do. And you could do something for me that no one else can do. Good works are prearranged and revealed to those who love Jesus. It was revealed to Mary. This was the time to break open that costly spike. And this is the time for extravagance. It was revealed to her. She acted on it. It changed the atmosphere of that house. And it's recorded. It was prearranged. But she listened closely enough to the breath and heartbeat of God. She knew the right thing to do at the right time. When I go to preach or counsel, before I make a phone call, I thank God that this phone call is prearranged and that the emotions I need to feel and the wisdom I need to have, the words I need to speak, that that's prearranged, I will have them. So anxiety is taken off the table. I am now going to open my mouth wide in confidence and trust that he will fill it. Oh, the joy we have when we trust him. Be not anxious for anything. If you're a listener, you'll know exactly what to say, exactly what to do, and exactly when to be there. Taking paths which he set so that we would walk in them, living the good life which he prearranged and made ready for us. And then Galatians chapter 6, verse 9. What do you do then when you find what God wants you to do that's good? Have you ever done something for someone and it wasn't appreciated? Have you ever felt like you've been taken for granted? Have you ever thought, hey, 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 wait a minute. What's in this for me? But when you find or we find the good work that God wants us to do, there's something to do to add to it. Let us not grow weary or become discouraged in doing good. If you know that God has called you to sacrifice something that's important to you, to give it up totally, to pour it out completely, and you know that you're to do it in a classroom or at work or in the family or at the hospital 
or in a prison ministry or in a prayer ministry, if you know that he told you that it's time for you to take time, talent, and treasure, listen, all we have to give to God is what he's given us. And so our sacrifices, when we say, you know, he asked him, could you not watch with me one hour? Couldn't you just cut out an hour of what I have freely given you and sacrifice that to, and offer that to me? Spend an hour with me. Now, I'm not saying being legalistic about that, but we can still offer a sacrifice of praise. But what is sacrifice? It's taking what he's given us and saying it's no more important for me to have that. I give it to you. I give it to you. Oh, how it moves his heart. He stopped that house. He said, listen and watch. This woman has done something that's going to be recorded through all of time and through eternity. What did she do? She had heard. She acted. And she gave it up. And she changed. She changed everybody. And you and I threw it. Because in doing good for at the proper time, there will be a proper time, we will reap. So don't give up, don't give out, don't give in. If we do not give in. I have a quote that I've used so often. Do all the good you can. By all the means you can. In all the places you can. At all the times you can to all the people you can, as long and as ever you can. Joseph, when should I conclude? I'm going to cut some things out and just save them for the the next service, but I will share this. if, ever, if you've known me and you've listened to me, please listen to me f- for about five minutes on something that has been like gold to me. Do you remember those old, probably, probably some of you old enough to remember the phone booths that were out on the street and they were, you know, rectangles and they had that accordion door? I read about a fellow who had pitched blackout and he was had lifted that heavy phone book uh, and he's looking for an address. Does that mean time's up? (laughs) And he's looking for an important address and he's frantic. He's got to find this phone number. But it's pitch dark. He doesn't have a flashlight, doesn't have a match. And a car pulls up rolls the window down and said, hey, buddy, when you shut the door, the light comes on. And so he shut that accordion door, bing, the light came on, and he could see what he needed to see. When we pray, the light comes on, and we know what we're supposed to do. It wasn't so many years ago, my wife said, I want to adopt, I want to adopt this little boy in Romania. I said, oh, hon, I, I, I don't know. But she knew, you know. And I got it ingrained deep into my spirit what knowing the will of God is. Number one, it's a thought, a passion, a dream, a desire you can't get rid of. It keeps coming back like the rising of the sun every day. It keeps coming back like springtime. It's always there. You can't get rid of it. The second thing is, scriptures affirm it confirm it. As you read and study the Word of God, God begins to talk to you about that thought you can't get rid of, whether it's a good thought or a bad thought, right or wrong. And then the trend of circumstances begin to move in an affirmative or a negative. So I said, "Hun, I, oh my, you know, we're 40 years old. She had the picture, little guy. He's 30 now. If you're watching, Michael, I apologize. I forgot your age. So then um, I heard a quote. It said, if you can't feed a hundred, feed one. And it came in, lodged there, and stuck for a while. And then as, you know, I read Scripture, and there's so many you could read, but one reached up and grabbed my heart, you know. I knew it was a breath of God breathing into me. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows 
in their distresses and to keep oneself untouched, unspotted by this selfish world. And I knew then, I knew it was God's will. I also add, and I don't have it on, I also add Colossians chapter 3, verse 15. Let the peace of God be the referee or the umpire in your life. If the peace isn't there, don't commit to it. Don't say it. Don't do it. But if you've had an ongoing passion and Scripture has confirmed it in the mouth of two or three witnesses, let everything be established. And then the trend of circumstances is going that way. Then run with all your might in that direction. For God is about to supply every possible need you have to see that done. And so I could tell you the story and the struggles of finally getting Michael to America. And uh, it's a beautiful story of God's faithfulness. But it's also a story of you got to put up a fight if you want to have what God has. Because it's called the good fight of faith. But be relentless in doing good, however God leads you. I love you. I'm glad to have been here today. And Joseph, I turn it back to you. It's just what we needed. You know, it's it's funny. If you've been with us the last few weeks, um, my preaching, it's just funny how the Lord, it's not my preaching, the Lord's preaching, but Lord's word, it's just funny how it all just blends together. You know, we've been on this journey the last two weeks about authentic faith, authentic prayer, and this is an authentic walk with the Lord. Uh, so I appreciate Pastor Mike being here for that. It really was. Y'all give it up for him one more time. Come on. You guys are not going to know what to do with yourselves of getting out so early. All right, so I'm going to preach another 20 minutes Um, because you you can't handle it. You just can't handle it. We'll go ahead and have our our servant keepers. You guys come on, come on up. We appreciate you guys. Servant, did I say keepers, leaders, servant leader? It's the same thing, right? No, (laughs) whatever. All right, there's uh, tithe and envelope or tithe and offering envelopes on the, the the chairs in front of you. Please uh, be obedient to our, our calling to serve the church, to give to the church. Uh, but it's between you and him. We're not trying to twist your arm in any way. Uh, this is your walk. This is your treasure uh, and your ability to honor him. So uh, the envelopes are there. You can go ahead and give. We'll go ahead and say this. As we give today, we're believing God for jobs and better jobs, more money, less hours, benefits, sales and commission, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, finding money, bills paid off, settlements, inheritance, rebates in return, debts demolished, royalties received, favor and success to the kingdom. Amen. Uh, Pastor Mike, you charity, you can guys, you guys can go ahead and head toward the back there before we close out. We do have a few things for you. I guess you 